Hi all, uh, I'm Momcho, nice to meet you, and this is a topic, challenges incorporating machine learning models in like real corporate business environments. Um, I want to start first about who am I and why did I choose this topic, because this is a bit unusual topic for a developer audience. So I started as a software engineer. Why? Because it's much easier to deal with computers than with people. They generally listen to you. They do exactly what you tell them. And if they don't do it, it's your fault. People, on the other hand, they're like much more complex. You speak with them. You sometimes understand. Sometimes they don't. So it's a messy thing. Naturally, software engineer, hey, easy thing. I have like probably around 10 years of experience in software engineering. And then I moved into a more of a managerial position. And again, why? Because there are certain stuff that really, really frustrates me. And I'm trying to explain what it is and give possible strategies for dealing with it. So let's open with a story that I like to tell Project from Hell. This is like my personal story in one of the companies that I've been. So we started a project. It was a data augmentation project. It's like nothing really that spectacular or difficult in the beginning. And we did it in a month or two. And then we tried to ship it. And it was like, ah, you know what? In order to integrate it in this core system, it has to work in under 50 milliseconds. So can you improve the performance? OK. We had to re-engineer it, re-architecture it, preload lots of things. And we did it. Let's integrate it. Let's go to production. Oh, by the way, you know what? Uh, you guys have only like 60% coverage and the other 40%, it's, it's not good to just like leave it like that. It's like, okay, those are the external sources you gave us, but we'll figure it out. So we create data sources, we hire more people, we start accumulating data, did all the tools to like make this data fresh, up to date alerting on when it falls down because it was now in our control. It took significantly longer, but hey, we're north of 98%. Everything is fine. We cover 100% of like the first couple of pages of results. So basically what people see. Let's go integrate it. Oh, you know what, guys? The team that's doing the core project now has to move it to the cloud, so there is a whole new big project, so they don't have time to integrate your data augmentation. OK. You go there, learn the code for the main core application, do back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, merge requests, pull requests, et cetera, et cetera. You integrate it, work some period of time as like a dark mode, so they're sure there is no performance penalty, and we are ready, right? Now, you know what, guys? The front-end team is out of bounds, so they can't display the additional data that you have. It's like, ah. Now I'm like without hair. Was like, Before that, probably I had some. So again, the same thing, the same team. Go learn the front-end front code base. How do they do stuff? Add our data next to the other that is displayed. And we are finally ready to go. Boom. Not yet. What happened then is like, because there was a lot of management change and product leadership change, the new product manager comes and says, hey, guys, what's your accuracy? And it's like, 
we've been telling you from day one that we don't have a way to measure accuracy because those are the only one data sources that we have. So there is no real ground truth there. Nobody knows if we are accurate or no until you like go and actually open the, okay, until you actually go to the airport, it was like an airline, you had to get information for the baggage. So we do manual testing, but it's never representative. We make an experiment, and because this is something that you see in absolutely every search, naturally there are some complaints about inaccurate data. Those complaints were deemed too high. We didn't have any numbers about them. So were they actually high or low? And the project was scraped. Great. This is now roughly two years from my life. Really, really frustrating. And the most frustrating part, that afterwards there is like some regulation implemented that you have to have this data. So the company paid an external provider that we evaluated beforehand and we found to be, uh, let's say it's not superior to our solution is the mild way to say it. So as you can see, this is like really, really frustrating experience for me. I really hate to do something, to do something well, at least I perceive I'm doing it well, and then it never sees the light of day. It's Nobody uses it, nobody can see it. And it turned out that if I only concentrate on the computer part, there is a lot of, lot of, lot of people problems that prevent me from doing what I want to do. Hence, I went to management and hence I picked the topic that I'm slightly passionate about, about like, hey, how do you go around all these issues? How do you live like a fulfilling life as a developer so you're not stuck in this continuous loop of chasing something that you never get? And why machine learning is here, why there is an ML part, because due to the nature of machine learning, all those problems get amplified, especially when you deal with clients and especially when you deal with clients that are let's say more old school, not that much into newer technologies. So what's, what's machine learning? There is, you don't specify, you don't define a solution, you don't define algorithm like a step-by-step. -step. If you use the textbook example of how to boil an egg, you don't like put water in the pot, put the pot, wait for five minutes, etc. There is no step-by-step solution. Instead, what you do, you provide the machine with a lot of examples of solved problems. Hey, you, the answer, in this case, the answer is this. In this case, the answer is that. And you throw a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of examples on it. And if your algorithm is good enough, and you've designed it well enough, and you've picked your data well enough, it learns to generalize from the data it sees. And now it's able to predict or solve future unseen examples. As you can imagine, there is a lot of issues with that. And by issues, I mean non-engineering issues, but like kind of explanation issues. First, this process is usually long. There is like a long training phase when you throw all those examples for it. Uh, in our company, for our bigger model, the training is around two weeks. And if I'm not mistaken, it happens on like four huge machines in parallel. All of those are with GPUs, so it takes a lot of time. And why I'm telling this is because when you find a problem, you can't just like fix it and release it next day. No, you just like need to do retrain everything and do it again. It's more or less a black box, like it learns something. It learns certain features, certain values. But how exactly does it work and why does it work like this? It's not something that you can easily tell. So there is research in this direction, but we are not there yet. It does have errors. It does have 
sometimes more errors than a naive solution will have, but it's trying to solve a, bit, a much harder problem. So there are strategies of how you can fix an error, but generally it's it doesn't get to the granularity of, hey, this example is really important. I need to get this example. Yeah, we can probably boost this example in the training, but that's generally going to bring, bring you a worse model. So it's not deterministic, not consistent always. Like, you do an improvement, your model performs better to all your metrics, all your evaluations, but some cases will regress, and that's a natural noise of the machine learning problem. Uh, also, it may have, may give very different answers to changes that are like not perceivable to a human. And here's like an example of adversarial image. So it correctly recognizes a panda, has some confidence, and then because somebody has internal knowledge of how the machine works, it can create an image that's practically indistinguishable for a human, but now the machine is completely sure that this is a given. So all those problems need to meet with the real world, with the real clients, with the real corporate guys in suits that have very, very high expectations of any solution they buy. Something about the clients, you know, those people again. Most of the time they are like not technical. And by not technical, I mean you can't speak with them in terms that you're used to speak with other engineers and even your technical product people. Uh, they want to understand confidence interval, they want to understand precision, recall, area under curve. Metrics that you use to evaluate the model, you can't just explain to them. They need a solution that works. I've put belief there because it's largely part of that. But those are usually risk averse. Those are decision makers that are responsible for like a business or a department that report to their, like, I don't know, CEO, stakeholders, etc. So they really, really don't want to, to fail. And usually in our case, there are lots of regulations because the data is quite sensitive. Uh, if, you, if you imagine, like, um, I don't know, medical records or something, they're behind a one regulation, if you imagine like credit cards or payments, they're behind other regulations. So you do not know what's the data of the clients. And I'll come back to this later, but that's a really important part. So what do you need to do to get your foot through the door, to get to the job interview stage of your product? First, you need metrics. And you need the metrics that are rel relatable and that make business sense. So you don't need, this is my recall. You need stuff like, hey, this is the amount of time you save now in your process when you use our solution. This is the improvement of the throughput you get. This is how much money you save. This is how much less complaints you do. Like business metrics that are relatable to the decision makers that will eventually vet or accept your product. Uh, I spoke about the errors. There needs to be really well-designed processes around the error handling. There is always going to be errors. No system is 100% accurate. A machine learning system even less, usually. Uh, this for those guys, it's unacceptable for you to have errors. So you need to design very good error handling procedures. Uh, a good idea is to reuse the current process as much as possible, because they're dealing with the task right now. 
be it in fully manual, semi-automatic way, so they know how to do it. So it's a good idea to just like say, okay, this part you take yourself. It's even better if you improve this process. If you make this process better, more uh, productive, more efficient, then even if your machine learning model is really, really bad and just automates a really tiny fraction of what it needs to, just the boosts you do by providing a solution that improves their current flow is good enough for you to get through the door and start being incorporated. Uh, enrich their process. Uh, and by enriching, what I mean is usually what happens, you enrich it with metrics. Because now you've thought of all those metrics that you want to evaluate the machine in the upper point, you can bring them up in, your, in the current process. So if you've designed a metric to say, what's the throughput of the system, you can now show what's the throughput of their current process. You can show uh, what time it takes for their process to finish, how much it costs, etc. So in case they don't have these metrics, and usually they don't, this is very valuable by themselves. And once you're through the door, the next step is how do you make them trust you and love you? Because then they give you the, the keys to the, to the business, to the business process, and then enable you to, to be much better. First, as I said, those really risk-averse people, they need to be, to feel, to have a sense of predictability and to have a sense of control. Um, let's say, for example, an update process. Like, corporations are notorious for the fact they hate updating anything because it brings unpredictability, because something can go wrong, because there can be a cost. Like, they're like nightmare stories of, like, people in large corporations still using Internet Explorer 6, et cetera. And how, how can you tackle this? For example, you have a model, you have a better model, but then you need to persuade your client, hey, move to the better model. Mm -mm. Let's say, what if it doesn't work? You can't guarantee that it would work. There are solutions you can engineer around that. So one of them, a good one, is which comes with a lot of engineering cost, but you have to do what you have to do to put your solution in front of people, is to give them, uh, give them metrics and comparison between the two models. If you manage to do some kind of like backwards compatibility between the new one and the old one, you can say, hey, here's the new one, try it. Let's try it on every data you had for the last, I don't know, two weeks, one month, whatever the case is. Here's the graphics. It does better, it does worse. If it does worse, you just don't push the button. Oh, you have a button. You have all the control on you. We are not updating. You're updating. Like, they really hate if you swap absolutely anything from underneath them. Just a big no-no. And then the, the point where they're like, you can see the eyes in the room lit, is when you start speaking about improvement over time. Like when you start explaining and showing them with real metrics that your algorithm learns, learns from their data, learns from their process, uh, like the manual process produces data that your solution consumes and becomes better, and you can show the trend, that's when they start feeling really, really, really good because they have the control they have the upper trend, and they know that the worst possible situation is they keep this trend. And then you start gaining insights into more and more in day to day. They get eager for you to automate other parts of the process, to give you more data, which makes you better, to integrate your solution more. Yeah. That's the first part. I need some water. Any questions for the first part? Oh, that happens all the time. 
usually the strategy is you pick one, you win one, and then you use them. This is like one-on-one, -on -one, 101 change, uh, change introduction. You go with the people that are enthusiastic about the change and let the more pessimistic see the good results. We'll get an example really close to that. So now I'm going to do several kind of case studies. It's not like case studies, but machine learning concepts that really know the books are like quite black and white. This is good, this is bad. Well, in practice, you start seeing that the things are a bit more to the gray side. So generalization versus overfitting. Overfitting is when you do really well on the examples you see, but you're unable to say absolutely anything for like new examples. And generalization is the, the otherwise, like you extract somehow the knowledge and you're able to predict new examples. And obviously gener generalization looks and sounds better. Every book tells you you should strive for that. And obviously it's much more difficult to achieve. Like an example of extreme overfitting that I love to give is like, because I guess many, if not many, some of you have participated in uh, programming competitions. And those are usually like, hey, here's the task, here's a uh, example input, here's the example output. And sometimes the task is really hard and you don't know how to solve it at all. But you know you're evaluated on like 20 examples and you say, hey, Okay, I'll just use the input and say, if it's this, I'll put this, if it's this, I'll put that, if it's this, I'll put this. And sometimes I'll hit like one of the examples and get some points. Extreme overfitting. So, is generalization always better? Let's have a study one where like our product, our task is to find, is there a vehicle in the picture? And if I just tell you this and don't tell you anything more, like you probably start collecting a lot of pictures of cars, of buses, like cities, traffic, etc. But then I can tell you who our clients are. First client is an airline. All of their images are images of planes. They are interested is their image of a plane. They're interested if their plane is there at a specific place in a specific time. It can be like, hey, is it part of an accident? Is it, has it landed on time? Has it flown on time? So our other client is a bus company. All they care about is the image of the bus. Is my bus on time? Is it on this stop when it has to be on this stop? Et cetera. And if you try to generalize too much, you get worse results because like, if you do something specific for planes and specific for buses, you're going to be much better. So is it a bad idea to do that? And you say probably when you have the full knowledge that these are your clients and those are that difficult, that different use cases, you should do that, but you don't always know that. It can be like, Cargo companies, but you don't know, is it like a ship cargo or a train cargo or a, a truck? Or it can be the army, but you don't know if it's like the Air Force or the tank brigade or the Marines. So as we spoke about the prerequisites that you need, good error handling, metrics, it's a very, very valid strategy to, to do a narrow distribution very well. And by narrow distribution, I mean one or two cases that are the majority of cases. You do them very well. You let everything else go through the manual error handling. You show immediate value, and you start getting the information you need about what the distribution of the data your client has. Because as we said, you don't know it. Like in this picture, is it a bus? Is it a plane? Is it both? Like the bus is a bit bigger, so will the 
plain company say that's a negative or positive? You don't really know. It's like not so black and white. Like, and I know overfitting is not handling narrow distribution, and this should not be the same term. But more generalization is not always better because the reality of what you're asked to do might be different than what you expect. And this overfitting dangerous, like why every book is telling me that overfitting is dangerous while well, I go to this talk and there's somebody telling me, hey, you should overfit for the best case and then take it from there. It's dangerous because it can do a lot of like really catastrophic effect. And here's an example, like you're trying to classify the documents in an organization. Can somebody see the difference in those two images? Those are the same form. You don't need to look at the text or something. Probably you can't see anything, but that's good as well. Because as we spoke, sometimes the machine outputs very different things because due to something that's like imperceivable for human eye. What I've done is I've made one of the images a bit yellowish, the first one. So you can very well imagine the scenario where you have like a company and there are a lot of departments and those departments send some documents for you to classify. And one of the departments uses like cheaper paper or something like this. So it's a bit yellowish. Humans won't catch this. The machine is really, really good at catching this. And it will say, oh, with like really high confidence, every time I see a yellow paper, it's from this department, so it's like a, I don't know, account opening form. Well, that's true, and that works really well until some other department starts using this cheap paper. And then you start to classify everything from the other department wrongly, and you're usually X. <laughs> so overfitting is dangerous. And pipeline. A way of tackling the problem that I just described is to create a pipeline. So a pipeline is generally when you have a complicated problem, you split it into several smaller and easier tasks, and you, then you can solve each of the tasks independently, you can evaluate it independently, and then you can put them together to make a solution. Like, for example, hey, make me a self-driving car. That's a really complex task, an overwhelming task. And you can try to split it. Yeah, you have the video input from the car. And you can say, OK, I'll detect all the cars, how they're moving. I'll detect all the pedestrians, how they're moving. And then I'll, using this information, I'll plan the path for the car and send the command to it. For our previous example with the documents, if you just take, like, I don't know, the text and the uh, locations of the text, the machine won't have any chance to pick up the yellow paper because you give her, like, not explicitly the feature, but you give the set of things it works with. Uh, it has a lot of benefits. It's much easier to get data annotations. Uh, it's much easier to get a lot of pictures and say, hey, here's a car, here's a car, here's a car, here's a car than to acquire a lot of video about how you should actually drive. Uh, it's easy to measure every part. Hey, this is my data set. Does my car detector perform well on it? Yeah, it gets all the cars, it gets them well. Or not, we need to work on it. Uh, it doesn't need to be an ML uh, model for each part of it. Some of the some of the parts can be solved with different approaches, like classical computer vision approaches. If they're good enough, they're good enough. Uh, it's easier to attribute errors, like when you have an error in the whole system, you can see which parts there is an error in. And if there is no part where there is an error, this is, this is the risk, like is the pipeline well enough, well defined, so is there enough information? For example, Here's another pipeline for the car. So maybe just because you know where the cars are and where the pedestrians are, you don't 
exactly know how to drive. Because you don't know if the light is green or red. You don't know if it's like a one-way street or closed exits or a roundabout or like whatever. So if you add like all the road markings, like traffic lights, signs, etc., you'll probably be able to create a better plan for the car. Will that be enough? Probably not. That's an example how you should enrich your stuff. So let's get another example. Husky dog detector. We love huskies. So a classical pipeline is like, you have an image, you have to output if there is a husky or not. So you split it into a dog detector and a dog breed classifier. The first part finds a dog, and the second part just tells you, is it a husky or not? Easy enough, you can do all of them independently. And if you do them both well enough, that should be it. It's like completely exhausted. Uh, it's easy for you to identify where the error is, like this called error attribution. For example, if you know that this picture, you don't perform well, like you see where the, for, where the dog has been identified. If the dog has been identified correctly on the left part, then your dog classifier is not good. So you should investigate that. If the, if the dog is not found, well, your classifier stopped no chance. Like, it doesn't make sense to improve it. And obviously, you don't do it error by error. You do it for like big error classes. This all sounds like really, really positive. Can anybody think of any friction that I'll introduce to clients if I go with a big pipeline of independent tasks? For example, yeah, my client is like a identified in case there are huskies on a picture manually. He has like 10 people, they look at pictures all day, say husky, no husky, husky, no husky. I'm trying to automate this, and I'm introducing this pipeline. So what the people now should do is like, in order to help me get even better in the future, they'll say, OK, here's a dog, here's a dog, here's a dog. This is husky, this is husky, this is not husky. So I introduced the fact that they need to do extra work for those immediate steps in order to provide data. And these steps are creating a lot of friction, and there is, it's useless for the client. They don't care where the dog is. They only care if there's a husky. So if you get this picture, and I tell you, please tell me where all the dogs are, <laughs> it's probably not the best thing. You can't say there's no husky immediately. But if I take you through the pipeline, I'll make you draw, I don't know, a lot of boxes to say, hey, here's a dog, here's a dog, here's a dog. Now my classifier will automatically say that there is no husky afterwards. But... So you need to design around this. It's as important as you design around their cases. It need to be a good and easy way for them to provide you information for your pipeline. And they need to be like, I don't know, for this, you can probably just go, OK, full manual, there is no husky. I don't want this image to go through the pipeline. I don't want to do all this data at all. So ah, you're done. I think I'm very fast. Maybe not. Conclusions. People matter. Fortunately, unfortunately, whenever you make a product, it's people who decide how it's going to be used. It. Is it going to be used? It? Hmm. And <laughs> uh, it's people using it. It's people paying for it. It's people suffering when the product is not good enough. Uh, the devil is in the details. So more often than not, those like 5% accuracy or uh, automation rates are not as important as all the mechanisms that we described around the model itself. So if you don't have good metrics, if you don't have a good way to um, handle errors, if you don't have a good way to annotate data, if you have not given 
the clients enough control or enough predictability. You can have a really, really good, even revolutionary model. It won't be there. And the last point is like, it's not in the talk, but it's like really important. Respect the tasks you're trying to automate. It's usually for those industries that we are a part of, it's like a long running process, like years. There are many reasons why the business process looks like this. Even like to an outsider is trying to automate it, it makes no sense. And people usually react really bad when you tell them you don't know what you're doing. You should do it this way, I'll automate it. You've been wrong all these 15 years that you're doing your job. Uh, this is like not flying at all. You're never getting into an enterprise with this attitude, and if you think you're much better than that, you should better create a competitor and put them out of business, or at least get acquired if they're a really big company. That's it. Questions? That is normal. I'm go also going to be reading out the questions coming in so I do. But if there are any questions in the audience, don't hesitate to raise your hand or just shout out the question. So starting off with something that you're going to answer very briefly because I don't want to dig too much deep into it. TensorFlow or PyTorch? Huh. Time's up. Another question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know this is a Google developer uh, group, but I'll go with PyTorch. Uh, TensorFlow 2.0 for me is trying to do too many things right now at once, and it can be cleaned up a bit. At least I would not try it on the first version. I'm pretty sure the 2.1, et cetera, will be much better. Uh, I would also not move out from TensorFlow 1 right now. I mean, to move from one to two, it's still a lot of work. And I'm going to wait for the next versions. You look at me as if you are kind of offending me personally, and I'm not taking it personally. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> answering the question, your question. So I'm it's not mine. It's somebody from the audience, actually. Mm. Reading out questions from the audience. Sorry. Any, any, any other questions? I don't have anything more in this video. So uh, you've been in uh, different kind of uh, industries. You already mentioned uh, a little bit the differences between machine learning and, and uh, what you've uh, encountered in other kind of companies. Do you like more enjoy what you're currently doing with machine learning? Because you're facing even more troubles than usual, even f facing people, with, which is a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I enjoy it more. Uh, I really believe in it. I really don't like boring, repetitive tasks. And I've always tried to automate anything that I'm like, keep on doing, 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 and feel I'm not getting smarter by doing. So I don't believe that the machines will bring up some dystopia and take us all out of jobs. This is like, yeah, it's normal fear, like industrial has done it, like probably automation will do it part of the way, but there will be always new things that people should be able to do. Uh, what you've been uh, showing us off here was rather integrated with big corporates. Uh, how is your feeling about uh, which is easier to integrate in a small, just starting of a business or something a big corporate with a lot of process and a lot of things to overcome? Uh, and have you faced the second, like the smaller company just emerging? The, the challenges are different. Uh, usually the challenges on the other side that you ask, the smaller companies, is that uh, all those solutions require a lot of time, a lot of research, and they're not cheap. So you have to be able to afford it. And for you to be able to afford it, it's like really difficult for a small companies without a well-established business model. But it's... Part of the issues are um, universal. I've spoken about this topic with my friends that work in, in Google, in, uh, in hedge funds. Like, the decision makers are always hesitant 
to give you a green light because they don't feel in control. Like even Google, when they were first introducing this, uh, I think it was like a meta type search when you, when you type, I don't know, Java, and on the site it shows you Java the language or Java the island, like because it has to find. This product was like, I know the guy that's been developing it since the beginning, and it was delayed for a couple of years just because people were not feeling comfortable putting it out because they didn't know what it would output. So even the most progressive companies have those frictions. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, the last one coming from me, when is Singularity coming? How much more time do we have? <laughs> it's never coming. <laughs> okay. Because it's people, it's people like us that are calling it. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the presentation. Let's thank Munchi once again. Thank you very much. Thank you.